Ninjask is a bug flying type with an erratic growth rate, meaning it levels up extremely slowly in the early game. Look at how little experience it gains from the tutorial Zigzagoon battle. Because of its typing, it has a 4 times weakness to rock moves, and Roxanne is the first gym leader. Yeah, I, uh, I think this one's gonna be pretty brutal. Rules for the challenge can be found in the description, check them out if you don't know my content. For base stats, Ninjask has 61 HP, 90 attack, 45 defense, 160 speed, and 50 special attack and special defense. Today I'm going to be using a brave nature which increases my attack and lowers my speed. Note there are little arrows on the stats now indicating which one of them has been boosted and lowered by my nature. There are two reasons I went for speed lowering nature. Obviously 160 is just overkill for a solo challenge when I'm going to have a badge boost as well as EVs. But the second one is that Ninjask's ability is speed boost. After every single turn in battle its speed gets raised by one stage. So this thing is based basically never going to move second. And I really do mean that because later in this challenge when it's getting paralyzed, it will still end up being faster than its opponent. But that's a little ways away, so let's focus on the early game. It starts with Scratch, Harden, Leech Life, and Sand Attack. Access to a bug type move that recovers my health is really nice, especially for Roxanne. Remember, the rock type does not resist the bug type, and I think that's a common misconception in the Pokemon community. Also, every time I think about the bug ground interaction, I expect that the ground type is going to resist the bug type. I go and look it up on Bulbapedia, and no, the ground type also does not resist the bug type. This interaction is only one way, and it is the opposite, so the bug type resists the ground type. So Ninjask has potentially a set that could work out against Roxanne. Harden can boost my defense, Leech Life can be dealing damage and recovering health, and Sand Attack can blind her Pokemon so that she doesn't hit me. Having said all of that, by the time I clear all of the trainers on the early routes of the game, as well as the rival, who is taking Chikorita today of course, I am only level 7 because the erratic growth rate is really bad early on. At low levels you want to be using rare candies with these Pokemon, but the first one available is in the Trick House after I leave Slateport City. By that point in the game the erratic growth rate will be leveling up much faster and by the late game it's going to take the least amount of experience to get to level 100. When I sat down to do this challenge I expected that Ninjask was going to need level 100 because Steven Stone is the final trainer and I don't like this bug's chances against him. For that reason alone, I have given Ninjask Hidden Power Fighting, just so I don't have to rely on a move like Dig to defeat all of his Pokemon. Of course, I fight all of the trainers in the early game. Clearing out some of the hikers with Geodudes takes a while with Leech Life, so I really don't think it's going to be enough to just utilize this move against Roxanne. But if I level up all the way to 20, then I'm going to gain access to Fury Cutter. All the other moves until then are basically useless. Fury Swipes, Mind Reader, Double Team is of course banned in my challenges. So I'm hoping that that this bug move, which has its damage double every time you use it subsequently, is going to be enough for Roxanne. Even if it isn't, there's still hope, because at level 25, I am going to get access to Swords Dance, which is one of the best setup moves in the game. I'm just hoping for the late game it's going to be enough, because Ninjask really doesn't have much bulk. I train primarily in Rust Turf Tunnel, because the EVs here are quite good. Everywhere else, you're going to gain a lot of speed, attack, and defense EVs in the early game, not very many special attack EVs, and even less special defense EVs. But in the tunnel, only Whismur show up, and they have HP EVs. This way I can gain more health and make it more likely that Ninjask is going to survive hits from Roxanne's Rock-type moves. The training was taking an extremely long time, almost 25 minutes, and I lost my patience here, deciding to go fight Roxanne at level 18 just to see if it was possible. After all, if I grind all the way to 20, spending an extra maybe 4 minutes to do that, and I can beat Roxanne at this level, I would be quite disappointed. So, let's see how things go against her. Up first is Geodude, and I want to draw your attention to the fact that both of these have both Rock Throw and Rock Tomb. And the effective power of these moves with 4 times damage is 300. Ninjask obviously needs to avoid hits as much as possible, so I'm going to start things off with the Sand Attack. This causes Rock Tomb to miss, which is perfect, and I get a speed boost. Now, this is actually bad, because Roxanne's AI prioritizes Rock Tomb as a speed control move when her Pokemon are slower than yours. That obviously isn't always the logic, I was a little surprised here when when the Geodude uses Rock Throw, and after a single turn of setup with Harden, it does almost half. 
I continue trying to set up against the Geodude, but it just hits too many rock throws, and I should also note that Leech Life really isn't doing very much damage. It looks like without Defense Curls, and I don't think the Geodude's ever going to use that move, it's going to take me four turns to knock it out using Leech Life. Here's the thing though, Sand Attack isn't very consistent, and because of that I can get hit by Rock Throw or Rock Tomb before setting up Harden. This scenario leads to Ninjask taking more than half damage. I tried out the idea of using Harden instead of Sand Attack on the first turn, after all the Geodude still can miss, rock moves are not very accurate, but this isn't going to work because I'm just not gaining enough defensive stats to survive enough hits. It looks like I was right from the start, I should be doing more training, so I'm going to go back to Rust Turf Tunnel and continue to knock out Whismur. I think of all wild Pokemon in Emerald, this is the one I am most likely to encounter as a shiny. I'm essentially shiny hunting this thing every time I get stuck at Roxanne. I started the grind from level 18 up to 20 at around 25 minutes on the clock, and it takes a total of 4.5 minutes to get there and finally learn Fury Cutter in the place of Scratch. I start things off against Roxanne using Harden on the first turn. I was thinking maybe I can use Harden, then one Sand Attack, and then Fury Cutter to stack up damage and sweep Roxanne's team. This doesn't end up working, and eventually I have to use Sand Attack on the first turn because I was starting to realize that Ninjas just needs to avoid all hits if possible. Trying to set up Sand Attack followed by Harden gives me loss after loss after loss after loss. I now have a total of 8 resets, and then I got a really really good run. I was able to set up all the way to plus 6, but then I get hit by an attack taking me down to red health, and at this point I realized I have to use leech life because that's the only way to gain an advantage from my defensive boosts. The thing is ninjas takes so much damage that it doesn't really matter when I'm gaining back health because the geodude can keep whittling away at me. These moves should theoretically work well together, but ninjas is just far too weak to the rock type for it to work, so in the end I have another reset after a long drawn out battle. The fact of the matter is, when playing this challenge, I was not thinking quite as clearly. I still thought that Sand Attack and Harden were going to give me an advantage eventually. Like, technically it is possible for the Geodude to just miss all of its attack, giving me a free setup, and then I can sweep using Fury Cutter. The resets keep coming in, but eventually I get the misses I need, and I start using Fury Cutter to attack. On the first turn, it does what I would describe as pathetic damage. Ninjask eats its Orenberry, going back into green health. I'm probably probably going to survive three more hits from here. Fury Cutter takes her Pokemon just above half health with its next hit, but the third one knocks Geodude out. From here, I need to not miss. Fury Cutter does have 95% accuracy, and when it misses, its power will be reset. My fourth attack doesn't miss, and her second Geodude goes down in a single turn. That leaves only her ace nose pass. Okay, this is the moment of truth. Zippy uses Fury Cutter, and it connects, knocking the nose pass out. After 35 and a half minutes, Ninjask has finally defeated Roxanne and earned itself the first badge. This one brings a 10% boost to my attack stat, and that will be useful because this thing is almost exclusively going to be using physical moves. I haven't gone through its full move pool yet, so let's do that now. Beyond Swords Dance at level 25, it learns Slash at level 31, which does not bypass beneficial stat changes in Generation 3, so Swords Dance and this high crit move can be paired together. At level 38, it learns Agility. It seems like Game Freak likes this design philosophy of giving fast Pokemon abilities that make them even faster, and then moves that make them even faster than that. Its final level up move is Baton Pass, which of course is irrelevant for a solo challenge. Through TM and HM, it gains access to a decent amount of coverage, Giga Drain and Solar Beam, which I'm probably not going to be using because they're special, Dig and Shadow Ball are both physical in this generation, Aerial Ace is probably going to be quite useful, and it does learn Cut by HM, which I should have mentioned before this, because it is physical and you can learn it before Roxanne. It would give Ninjask a move that can deal direct damage to her, but I really really don't like the fact that you can't delete it until Lily Cove City, plus it only has 95% accuracy. If you come from later generations, you'll probably think Hidden Power is a special move, but no, in this generation it deals the category of damage that is paired with its typing. That does mean I will be able to pair it with Swords Dance. After saving Pico, I battle the Rival. This is an optional fight, but Ninjas isn't going to have a problem because it's so overleveled. Plus, I want to do as much training right now as possible to get to level 25 as soon as I can. Once I gain access to Swords Dance, this whole run 
should get much easier. I catch my HM users, take the ship to Duford Island, pick up the Silk Scarf to boost normal type moves, and finally deliver the letter to Stephen Stone in Granite Cave. Okay, question is, what do I do next? Well, I'm going to continue my training by depositing all of my HM users, and then inside of the gym, I won't fight any double battles, instead getting all of the experience for Ninjask to help it level up. By the time I complete this, it's only level 21, almost there to 22, but it's nowhere near getting Sword Stance. So I guess my current moveset of Fury Cutter and Leech Life for damage and Harden and Sand Attack for setup is what I'm going to have against Brawly. I figured it was safe to fight him just because the Bug type and the Flying type both resist fighting type moves, and Brawly has absolutely no type coverage. My strategy for this fight is very simple, set up Harden once so that he's going to do very little damage when he does attack, then stack up Fury Cutter and hope that I can knock out his Pokemon fairly quickly. The Machop does no Seismic Toss which bypasses my defense setup so maybe that wasn't the best idea, I probably should have just gone for Fury Cutter right away. Also Brawly's lead really likes bulk up and setting up makes Fury Cutter do even less damage, it's just chipping away at his lead and remember he does have super potions, eventually he uses one healing but luckily Fury Cutter isn't missing, so I take him down to just above half health, and then KO with my next hit. Okay, Meditate's next, I easily one-shot, and that leads to his final Pokémon, Makuhita. If Fury Cutter hits, I win, and it does. Slaveport Beach is a great area of the game. Not only do I get the soft sand and a heart scale so that I can use the move reminder later on, which is definitely going to be relevant in this challenge, I also get the opportunity to do some extensive training leveling Ninjask up. All of the battles here, as well as in the museum, bring it close to level 24, and there are still a lot of trainers north of here before Mauville City. I was wondering if maybe I would use one rare candy to go from 24 to 25 to get Swords Dance, but no, by the time I solve the first puzzle, I'm almost level 20 anyway. So I'll just fight another trainer, level up, and finally learn Swords Dance in the place of Harden. Do note that by this point I have taught Ninjask Cut. Using only bug type moves was just not enough coverage and all the battles were so slow, so the normal move frustratingly is going to hang around on my set for quite some time. The rival battle which I call Rival 2, although it's technically the third rival battle in these playthroughs is next. The Wingull knows Wing Attack, which does make sense, but it's not strong enough to knock me out so I can set up with Swords Dance. I get to plus 4 attack and then I use cut, knocking out in a single turn. Okay Ninjask, please just don't miss against the Combuskin. This is another reason I taught cut, because against a fire type, Fury Cutter has an effective power of 3, and Leech Life has an effective power of 7. Yeah, don't want to be using those moves. Cut hits, knocking his ace out, and with that I can easily clean up the Lombre that's last. Up next is Watson, but before that fight I'm going to clear out all the trainers surrounding Mauville City. These routes I have to backtrack through later on, so doing the mandatory battles now just makes more sense. After all, the Electric Type Specialist is one of the best trainers in the entire game, and Ninjask is technically weak to him. These fights, as well as some of the battles in the gym, bring it up close to level 27, and I figured this would be enough, so here's Watson. Voltorb is his first Pokemon, and its moveset is really good against Ninjask. It has Rollout, two electric type moves, Spark can paralyze, luckily I have a Cherry Berry, and it also knows Self Destruct, and of course this is the move that it goes for on the first turn. It does massive damage, taking Ninjask down to just above half health. Okay, so it looks like I'm going to continue my setup against the Electrike. Luckily it cannot paralyze me unless Static activates, which is a 30% chance. If you're a little bit confused why the Electric isn't using Shockwave, this is because the AI is trying to match my setup with the Electric using its own Howl. Of course, this makes no sense for Watson to do, so he's basically throwing. I use Fury Cutter, hoping to one-hit, but no, it just takes the Electric to red health and static activates. That burns my Cherry Berry, but at least I'm getting set up because my next Fury Cutter can knock it out. And once again, it paralyzes Ninjask. But like I said before, because of my speed boost, when his Manectric comes out, I am still moving faster. Note my overlay isn't calculating the speed cut from paralysis, but if you just divide 318 by 4 you'll find that I am still faster than all of Watson's Pokemon. Fury Cutter hits the Manectric, knocking it out, and that leaves only Magneton. This is where I really need to not miss, and Fury Cutter doesn't. With that, I have earned myself the third badge and a boost to my speed stat, which is just perfect for Ninjask. Yay, we're even faster. By the way, all of you really like to complain every time I use a speed-lowering nature, and if you complain about it today, I just 
want to thank you for helping me out with the YouTube algorithm. If you really like hating on me for speed lowering natures, in the future I will be using a Spinda, and yes, I have given it a speed lowering nature. So there you go, a little bit of comment fodder. Okay, back to the run. Heading north, I can pick up the TM for secret power, which is finally a good normal type move that deals direct damage. Actually, this is the first reliable damage dealing move that Ninjask is going to get access to. I teach it in the place of Fury Cutter because that move is not really going to have a niche anymore. In Fall Arbor Town, I pick up the TM for Dig. This is going to be a fantastic move, but I wasn't really sure what to delete on my set. Holding onto Leech Life feels a little bit safer for me because it is a form of recovery, plus it's super effective against dark Pokemon, and that could be useful against a trainer like Maxi. I don't really have to worry about Intimidate with this run because while it does lower my attack stat, I can just use Swords Dance to get rid of the debuff right away. Okay, Mighty Enna use Sand Attack. Really annoying that this move still hits flying type Pokemon. I try to knock the Mighty Enna out right away with Secret Power, but I don't quite have enough damage yet. On this terrain, my Secret Power inflicts Confusion, so Mighty Enna gets messed up, and because of that I have more time to set up with Swords Dance to plus 3 and then knock his lead out. Secret Power from there one-shots the Camerupt as well as the Zubat. I grab the Meteorite, but I'll return it to the Scientist for a prize later on. For now, I head into the Lava Ridge Gym to face Flannery. Typically in this fight, it's very easy to set up against the Nummel, but that might not be the case with Ninjask because this Fire-type Pokemon sets up Sunny Day, and that made me think that Overheat is going to do massive damage. So let's try to go for the knockout now. Secret Power takes it down, Ninjask levels up to 31 where it can learn Slash. I'm going to put this in the place of Secret Power because it will be able to deal a little bit more damage in the case that it gets a crit. Slugma faints to a single hit, next is Camerupt. It does not have Magnitude, and even if it did, I have a Flying type, and if I use Dig, it still can't hit me. With the super effective damage, I one-shot and move on to her ace, Torkoal. Okay, so right now it looks like I'm about to do it, but uh, I make the weirdest choice and choose Swords Dance. I think at the last minute I got a little bit scared of the Torkoal, thinking that it would survive a Dig, but setting up makes absolutely no sense because then Torkoal just uses Overheat and it one-shots Ninjask. Okay, uh, not my finest moment. In the next fight, I just set up twice against the Nummel. This is by far the safest for choice. I can sweep through the rest of her team just using Slash, no need to use Dig on the camera up. the normal type move is more than enough. But I am going to use Dig against the Torkoal for super effective damage, and this allows me to take out Flannery's Ace, earning myself the fourth badge. On my way backtracking through the middle of the map, I do a detour from Mauville City all the way down to Slateport City to pick up a TM for hidden power. This is going to be useful against Norman because I can teach it in the place of Slash to have super effective damage. Spinda's first. Uh, this thing's really bad, so I'm just going to set up Swords Dance here while I have a Person Berry so it can't even confuse me with a move like Teeter Dance. I get to plus 4 before the status burns my berry, and then I'm going to go on the offensive with Hidden Power. Now, one thing to note, if Hidden Power does not knock out the Slacking, because Hidden Power is internally coded as a normal type move, the slacking can use counter against it. This is regardless of the type that Hidden Power has, so even if you have something like Hidden Power Water or Hidden Power Electric, counter is going to work against it. Instead, I'm just going to play really safe against the slacking using Dig so that Ninjask goes underground on the turn that it attacks. I deal damage, almost half, and then I can use Hidden Power to knock his ace out. That's a really easy fifth badge, and with it comes a 10% boost to my really low defense stat. This is a boost that is a little bit useful. With access to Surf, I'm going to have to backtrack through the middle of the map. There is so much backtracking in Emerald. I don't really remember this from when I was a kid, but now that I have to do these challenges over and over again, it really stands out to me. While I'm doing this backtracking, there's the chance for me to pick up two rare candies, and I should discuss these items now before we get too far into the run. Like I said earlier, the erratic growth rate levels up very slowly early on and speeds up as it gets towards level 100. Logically, it seems to make sense to use rare candies earlier on with Pokemon. Pokemon like this, but you just don't have the quantity of them until you're later into the game when Ninjask is leveling up fairly quickly. After all, now in the Weather Institute, when I'm fighting trainers like these grunts, I am getting a decent amount of experience from each one of their Pokemon. Right now it seemed a little bit counterintuitive to me to use rare candies, so I'm going to continue to hold on to them. I'll be using them as soon as I run into a trainer that I find difficult. The rival is definitely not that. But inside of the gym, there is this tag team battle, very similar to the tag team battle in Generation 2. 
You have to face two trainers in a row, if you deposit your HM users, that is. Otherwise, this is a double battle. In this case, Ninjesi is taking a lot of damage from the flying types, and while I do defeat the first trainer, I only have 12 HP left over for the second one. I chanced it here going for a Swords Dance to one-hit both of the following trainer's Pokemon. Maybe I should have just gone for Cut. Doduo is pretty weak, but in the end, it ends in a loss. And since I deposited my HM users, I'm just going to take the Blackout here, so I only have to face one trainer when I re-enter the gym. Still, this next fight is actually really scary. I get taken all the way down to five hit points by the Pelipper's Wing Attack. That is a sentence I, uh, I didn't think I would ever have to say, but yeah. So maybe Ninjask is going to struggle against Winona. I'll try it once with our rare candies, but I think I'm going to have to use them here. Swablu's first, I take the risky choice of setting up with Swords Dance because it can use Perish Song. But it doesn't, I use Cut and knock her lead out in one hit. Next is Tropius, I have a much better chance setting up against it because its moveset isn't very good. Aerial Ace can deal decent damage, actually over a third in this case, but Winona is just stuck using a Hyper Potion so I knock the Tropius out and move on. Pelipper does not use Protect, I knock it out in a single turn, and that leaves only two Pokemon, Altaria and Skarmory. She chooses her Ace first. This is actually actually good for me because it's going to be setting up Dragon Dance to try to match my speed and to get better attack. But because of speed boost, I have a ridiculous amount of speed anyways, so there's no chance that she moves first. I finish her ace with two hits and move on to the Skarmory. Hidden Power Fighting is useful here, and I one-shot. Okay, so I beat Winona on my first attempt. My prize is the ability to learn Agility, which uh, we're going to say no, we do not need more speed. I make what I consider to be a small mistake in the next section of the playthrough. At Mount Pyre, after defeating Team Aqua, I do not pick up the Shadow Ball TM, and I really should have. Upon arriving in Lily Cove City, I'm going to use the Move Deleter to get rid of Cut. Good riddance, this move is just completely terrible. I now have access to Fly, so I go back to Fall Arbor Town, give the Meteorite back to the Scientist, and in return, I get TM27, which I'm going to use to teach Ninjask Return. Right now it has an effective power of 105, once I'm using the Silk Scarf. Maxi in the Magma Hideout is really easy. Ninjask almost perfectly counters his team. Sword Stance gets rid of Intimidate and Speed Boost gets rid of Scary Face. But uh, yeah, then the camera hits with Rock Slide and one-shots me. Okay, so it turns out I I'm going to need two Swords Dances to make this fight as easy as it should be. Once I do that, I'm also using the Person Berry, so it gives me a free Swagger. Now I have plus five, and of course I sweep his team. The Aqua Hideout is next. Uh, nothing to report here. Matt is easy. After that, I go out onto the sea, explore Shoal Cave, picking up a rare candy, and then after making my way to Pacific Log Town, I fly back to Mon Lost Deep City to head into the Psychic Gym. What I'm finding in most Emerald playthroughs is that this is the place where it makes sense to use your first rare candies. I have collected a total of 12 to this point, so I'm going to go up from level 45 all the way to 57 before facing Tate and Liza. This is where Shadow Ball would be really useful. Right now I am relying on Return and Hidden Power for damage against their Pokemon. Also, I decided to take my time to set up Swords Dance, but after the first turn where Claydol always uses Earthquake, it goes for Ancient Power, dealing massive damage. I think I need to attack now if I have any hope of surviving. Return one-shots, so it's not going to get another one of these moves in. Zatu goes for Calm Mind, which is perfect, it's not attacking. I use Return to knock it out, just so it doesn't use Psychic. And that's also playing around the fact that I know Soul Rock is probably going to use Sunny Day. The next choice is a little bit more tricky. Do I knock out Soul Rock and avoid Flamethrower, or Lunatone and avoid Hypnosis? I decided on the latter, hoping to survive a Flamethrower. I do think this is the worst choice now in retrospect, but it doesn't matter anyway because Flamethrower gets a critical hit. Instead of setting up to plus 4, I'll go to just plus 2, then knock out the Clay Doll, but this is problematic. After finishing the Zatu, the Lunatone comes in, and I am still prioritizing it, but at plus 2, I don't have enough damage to one-hit it. If you didn't know, the Soul Rock has more physical attack and physical defense, so I'm not going to knock out it in one hit either, and as a result I have another loss. Okay, so I'm going to adjust my strategy one more time. Sword Stance turn 1, knock out the Clay Doll, avoiding Ancient Power, set up one more time as Soul Rock establishes Sunny Day, knock out the Zatu, and from there finish the Lunatone, avoiding Hypnosis, and just barely survive the second sun-boosted flamethrower with a sliver of health and knock out the Soul Rock. Taden Liza's badge gives Ninjask a much needed boost to its special defense. Maxi and Tabitha in the Space Center are actually a problem, this time because of confusion. I've set up with Swords Dance, and because my attack stat is so high and my defense is so low, Ninjask is dealing almost half to itself in confusion. This allows them to get in one turn of chip damage, finishing it off. 
Luckily, I only have one reset here. Archie is straightforward, I have no problems against him. I have to do a bunch of plot stuff, and then I head into the Sutopolis City Gym to face Juan. Okay, this one should be straightforward. I have a person berry I can set up with Swords Dance until the Love Disc confuses me, which happens after my second Swords Dance, so I have plus four. This should be enough. 514 attack is so much. Plus, I'm like on average 15 levels above his Pokemon, so yeah, I one shot the Kingdra, and this is an easy win. Against Wally, I'm not gonna have any issues. Even though the Altaria has Aerial Ace, it likes setting up Dragon Dance, giving me a free Swords Dance, and from there I just sweep. Earlier in the game, when I made it to Pacific Log Town, I picked up a second return TM. This is important because before the league, I'm going to teach Aerial Ace in the place of return so that I have a move that bypasses accuracy checks for Sydney. Ninjask has a major advantage here. I can set up with Swords Dance essentially for free, but I do want to be careful of the Mightyena because it knows Roar. If I continue setting up above plus three with either my speed or my attack stat, then it's going to try to switch me out. So once my second Swords Dance comes through, I use Aerial Ace, knocking his lead out. Absol feints to Aerial Ace, and I continue using this move against Shiftry and Cacturn, which are obviously one hits. All that remains is Crawdont. I really should have gone for Aerial Ace here just in case I missed, but Hidden Power gets the job done anyway. Okay, Phoebe is also going to be easy because Dustclops goes for Protect turn 1, giving me a free setup with Swords Dance. Now it would have been better to have Shadow Ball here, also against Tate and Liza, but Aerial Ace should be enough. It has a decent amount of PP, and I'm not going to get stalled out by her pressure. Plus I have Dig as a fallback just in case I need it. However, Ninjask doesn't, and I make it to Glacia. She technically has a type advantage against me since I'm a flying type, but the Celio is not very good. It has Hail, Encore, Ice Ball. I don't want to get trapped using Swords Swords Dance by its Encore, this can be really, really bad, but it chooses Ice Ball right away, which is basically Ice-type rollout, so I don't want to let it stack up power. After one Swords Dance, I use Hidden Power and knock her lead out. Next is Glalie, it knows Ice Beam, I need to knock this thing out right away, and it goes down. I think of her Pokemon, the only one that has a chance of surviving is the Wall Rain, but I was surprised when Hidden Power one-shots it, so Ninjask has made it to the final Elite Four member with no issues. To prepare for Drake, I'm going to give the White Herb. Honestly, uh, I think the Citrus Berry would have been better for this fight because getting hit by Rock Tomb and having my speed lowered is uh it doesn't matter. For other Pokemon, this does sometimes matter, but you know what does matter? Getting hit by Rock Tomb after taking half damage from it, and uh yeah, Ninjask just faints. So that's my first reset during the Elite Four. I guess since the Shell Gun is doing so much damage, I should knock it out and move on to the Flygon and then try to set up another Swords Dance. Even this is risky. I'm using Aerial Ace when I think I should be using Return for this fight. I just barely survive Flamethrower. Aerial Ace one one hits, he sends in Altaria next, Aerial Ace continues its spree, Salamence comes in, intimidating me, lowering my attack to plus three, but still, Aerial Ace has enough damage. Ninjask is going to do this, Kingdra is last, I use Aerial Ace, and it faints. So, Ninjask has made it to the champion with a decent amount of momentum. I hope it keeps going. Waylord is first, I set up Swords Dance, which is probably a bad idea, Water Spout deals massive damage. Now it's time to use Aerial Ace, taking the Waylord down to red health, luckily it misses Blizzard. Okay, uh, did he just give me the win? I know he's going to use a full restore now, so I can set up another turn of Swords Dance, ensuring that Aerial Ace will one hit on the next turn. With plus four attack, my Lodic falls to a single hit, I went for Dig on the Tentacruel, but I'm sure Aerial Ace would have done it as well. Ludicolo's next, now I specifically mentioned this thing in so many videos leading up to this one, Ninjask is prepared. It's a bug flying type, it has a flying type move, it has plus four attack, so of course Ludicolo faints. Good riddance. Ninjask levels up to level 69. Nice. Whiskash is next. Aerial Ace knocks it out in one turn. Gyarados has Intimidate, lowering my attack, but Aerial Ace is neutral and still does enough damage. So Ninjask gets a sub two hour champion split, and that's with 19 resets. In recent Emerald runs, this is not a great time, but overall, I think Ninjask is performing a lot better than I was expecting. To prepare for the final battle of the run, I'm going to do three things. First of all, grab the leftovers. Second, get a rare candy from the Safari Zone. And third, go to the move reminder to teach Harden in the place of Aerial Ace. This way I can keep both Hidden Power and Dig on my moveset because both of these moves are quite good against Steven's Pokemon. But I'm honestly not sure if I'm going to be able to do this because my Ninjask is only level 73.
Steven's level 77 Skarmory is first. I need to set up hard in here so its aerial aces will deal less damage, but it goes for toxic right away, and I don't have a counter for that. For the next fight, I teach rest in the place of dig so that I can bypass the annoying status move. Okay, so how much is aerial ace going to deal after I get set up? Well, not very much, but it's going to deal massive damage if the Skarmory gets a critical hit. With only plus two defense, using rest is a little bit sketchy because by the time I wake up, I only have one more turn to use harden, and then I have to use rest again. By the way, apologies for the speed stat, which is now over a thousand. Yes, this is possible in generation three. I have since added some code that will make this number a little bit smaller if my stats hit four digits. Just so you know, you'll see that soon in my follow-up attempt. While I use rest, I'm giving time for the Skarmory to crit, and eventually it gets one, knocking Ninjask out. I'll keep trying here against Steven until I get to attack, because I want to see how much damage Hidden Power is going to do. By the way, Hidden Power Fighting is a really good move against Steven, because it can hit all of his Pokemon. The Clay Doll is annoying because it's a psychic type, but overall it's one of his weakest Pokemon, and its only damage dealing move against Ninjask is Ancient Power, which only has 5 PP. In the next battle, I managed to stall the Skarmory out, I wake up. So, let's try Hidden Power. It does more than half. I decide to rest one more time, healing. This gives me green health by the time I knock the Skarmory out and move on to the Clay Doll. Unfortunately, Hidden Power Fighting is not Brick Break, so when it sets up Reflect, I'm dealing less damage, and this fight slows down because he uses a full restore. Also, Clay Doll's dealing decent damage, but as long as it doesn't get a critical hit, I should be able to stall out Ancient Power, and then it won't be able to do anything to me. That's what happens. Leftovers heals me to full. I knock out the Psychic type, and Steven chooses Cradley next. Hidden Power one-shots? Okay, that's perfect. Armaldo survives. It uses Ancient Power, dealing massive damage without a critical hit, I will add. But because of how much damage Hidden Power is doing, it's not going to get another attack in, so I move on to the Aggron. It takes four times damage, fainting in a single turn, but Metagross takes neutral damage, so it's probably going to survive. That means I need to live through one hit, in this case Psychic. Ninjask survives on 26 hit points and knocks the Metagross out. That's a first playthrough time of 2 hours, 7 minutes, and 28 seconds, with 21 resets, 1 blackout at level 72, with a game time of 7 hours and 32 minutes. In my first playthrough real-time tier list, Ninjask earns itself a time just ahead of Flygon and behind Rayquaza. Of course, my skill as a player has improved a lot since I did those two runs, so let's see how it did in terms of game time when compared with all the other first attempts I did. In this metric, it's a little bit worse, getting a spot at the top of the C tier, just behind Relicanth and ahead of Breloom. But if you spend time looking at this tier list, you can also realize that my experience as a player is playing into game time as well. After all, Rayquaza and Mewtwo are in the B tier, along Alongside Pokemon like Milotic, Flygon, and Relicanth of all Pokemon. So we of course need to do a follow-up playthrough to get more objective results. Actually, I'm gonna need to do two follow-up playthroughs because Roxanne is quite tricky. Of course, it seems like using Fury Cutter with maybe one sand attack or no setup at all could get through at level 20 with no resets. Alternatively, there's a strategy that seems safer, which is to grind all the way to 25, obtain Swords Dance, and sweep her team. But I said it seems better because maybe Ninjask can still lose and get resets after doing all the additional training. So let's compare these two different approaches. My second run with Ninjask uses the Swords Dance strategy because I wanted to ensure that I had a result that I could put in the tier list in case the Fury Cutter strategy ends up being far too risky. With it, I think there is a serious chance that I just won't get by Roxanne because I felt very lucky last time when I defeated her. But the cost of consistency and safety, especially for an erratic growth rate Pokemon in the early game, is extreme and I really mean that. It takes me a total of 44 minutes and 12 seconds to level up and learn Swords Dance. Fun fact, this was so much training that I maxed out my HP EV. Okay, so with Swords Dance, here's how Roxanne goes. Turn 1, I use Harden, so I'm not taking very much damage. Judude can only do about a quarter to me now, giving me time to set up Swords Dance once, and then start using Fury Cutter. With the attack boost, I'm able to two-shot her first Pokemon, one-shot the second Geodude, and one-shot the Nose Pad. That is a zero reset Roxanne split for Ninjask, although it did take three quarters of an hour, roughly the same amount of time as a fully evolved yellow playthrough. Okay, so how does Fury Cutter go? If I fight every single Pokemon that shows up in the wild as well as all the trainer Pokemon and then massacre Wismer in Rust Turf Tunnel, by 27 minutes and 54 seconds I have learned Fury Cutter. That means if I can beat Roxanne sometime in the next 17 minutes I will have a faster time with this run. For Roxanne, you can see that I dropped Sand Attack. I don't think setup here really helps. Instead, I'm just gonna go for Fury Cutter right away. I get a lucky turn one critical hit, which is really good. Then because of my Oranberry, I am going to survive the next 
boost attack from Geodude, allowing me to stack up Fury Cutter a little bit more. I get a third hit, knocking her first Pokemon out, and now I am really rolling. Fury Cutter takes out her second Geodude, Nose Pass comes in, and I knock it out, defeating Roxanne with no resets. Okay, I am locked into this run now because I can't imagine getting this kind of luck again in a follow-up playthrough. By the way, I do something a little bit strange here, which is I skip Brawly and instead just go to Slayport Beach training. I wanted to gain access to Swords Dance as soon as possible, but this is really unnecessary. I should have just fought the Fighting Type Specialist right away. Before the rival, I ensure that I leveled Ninjask up to get Swords Dance. Unfortunately for me, I still have one loss here because the Wingull confuses me with Supersonic, and this is the undoing for Ninjask. Remember, there are no person barriers available before this point in the game, so if I'm using Sword Stance on turn 1, there's no way for me to play around that. Supersonic is really inaccurate though, so it just misses on my next attempt. Okay, let's talk about Watson. I trained a little bit more for him this time to get to level 31 so that I have access to Slash. I felt this would be more consistent than going with Fury Cutter with 95% accuracy and relying on it against a Pokemon like the Magneton. I set up more with Sword Stance against the Voltorb because it didn't use self-destruct, and then at plus 4 I'm able to sweep through Watson's team, one-shotting every Thing, including the Magneton. Because I leveled up for Slash, I don't need to teach Secret Power, I can just keep using this high crit rate move. For Flannery, I switched things around a little bit. I now have Return, which I put in the place of Fury Cutter, and ensuring that I get to plus 4 with Swords Dance gives me a first attempt victory. I backtrack through Slateport City, grabbing Hidden Power Fighting, and then I crush Brawly. I can take the boat back to Petalburg City, where I face Norman with Hidden Power, and he's obviously easy as I explained before. This time my moveset and my level is slightly higher, so I don't have problems in Winona's gym, and because Ninjas can set up against the Tropius, it doesn't have problems against her flying-type Pokemon. In Mount Pyre, I don't make the same mistake twice, picking up Shadow Ball, and Dig is basically useless at this point in the run, so I'm going to teach the Ghost-type move in its place. In more modern Emerald runs, I am also fighting the rival in Lily Cove City to gain access to the department store. This can give me access to Substitute, but I'm not going to use it today. Instead, I'm going to take this opportunity to buy three more protein, increasing Ninjask's attack. In my previous playthrough, I somehow missed one rare candy. If I don't, I have 13 before Tate and Liza, bringing Ninjask up to level 64. The advantage of Shadow Ball here should be obvious. With one Swords Dance, I'm going to be able to sweep all of their Pokemon in one hit each. Because of that, I'm minimizing the number of turns that they have to attack. This quite literally makes the difference for Ninjask because it survives on red health. Juan and Wally are very easy, leading me to Sydney. For this fight, I teach Aerial Ace in the place of Return like I did before, but I'm hanging on to Shadow Ball for Phoebe, who is next. With the ability to bypass accuracy checks, Sydney can't do anything to me. Phoebe is also completely trivial because one Swords Dance followed by Shadow Ball gives me a free sweep. Glacia is easy as was the case before, and then for Drake, I teach Return in the place of Shadow Ball. This gives me better, more reliable damage to sweep his team with, and I have no resets. Against Wallace, Swords Dance once, takes some damage, it's okay, Citrus Berry, I'll recover some health, plus I know I'm not going to knock him out, meaning I can set up one more Swords Dance getting to plus 4, allowing me to sweep his team. And then the strategy is the same for Steven. Hidden Power rests Swords Dance and Harden, with the leftovers for healing, and my Ninjask is level 77. The Skarmory gets a total of 2 critical hits, causing resets, but after that I'm able to get fully set up, and from there Ninjask is a sweeping machine, crushing all of his Steel and Rock types. And with him finished, Ninjask gets a third place through time of 1 hour 57 minutes and 52 seconds, with 3 resets, 0 blackouts, at level 78, with a game time of 7 hours and 27 minutes. I think the one flaw of this final run that I did is the fact that I overleveled too much. I don't need to be that high for the final battle of the game. The place in the game where I would consider cutting training is right before Tate and Liza, but I think for this run specifically, that would have given me at least one reset because the fight against them was fairly close. Either way, I'm quite happy with these results because Ninjask was able to get a sub 2 hour time. Now you might be curious about what happened when I used Swords Dance early on, and surprisingly, the results are very close. With that playthrough, my second playthrough, I got a time of 2 hours, 1 minute, and 5 seconds, with 4 resets, 0 blackouts at level 76, with a game time of 7 hours and 44 minutes. After completing these runs, I was really shocked that the times weren't further apart. When you train for Sword Stance before Roxanne, you don't have to level up to get it for the Rival or Watson, and that does save some time, so even when you get by Roxanne at level 20, you still have to invest time in training after her. The training is of course more efficient, but that equalizes the time a little bit. Then my overtraining prior to taking 
Kate and Liza allowed more time to accumulate, and by the time I defeated both of them, the times were only about 2 minutes and 15 seconds apart. I knew I wouldn't be able to get another Roxanne split that was that lucky in the near future, so these are going to be Ninjask's results. Today, with a time under 2 hours, it saves itself from a Bruno tier finish, and earns itself a placement in the Lieutenant Surge tier. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, it means the world to me. Thank you so much. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.